It's the language of the universe. But I don't understand it. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Math and Physics Podcast. I'm your host, Parker. And I'm Ray. And we welcome you to episode number 45, where today, as you might have already seen, we have a very special guest on. We have Grant Sanderson, more popularly known on YouTube as 3Blue1Brown. So, Grant, how how are you today? I'm doing pretty well. Uh, Can't complain. How are you guys doing? Phenomenal. So doing well. We, we phenomenal. This, uh, yeah, phenomenal. Upping the bar. Yeah, I don't know because, if I've ever known someone so, who's doing phenomenal. <laughs> Parker uh, mentioned we were talking about before before we started uh, that we just had our math midterm for U of T. So that was uh, pretty interesting. Quite uh, quite a few topics there that you know we can uh, we can discuss. So before we get into it, let's just talk. So how was um. How is like the quarantine situation in your area right now? Like the the lockdown or is there a lockdown? Yeah, I mean, it's not too bad. Uh, so I, I live in the Bay Area and, you know, for much of the quarant- for the pandemic, it's been kind of on and off. But mm-hmm. it's uh, like most things that we'll do are happening outside anyway. I work from home by default, so that aspect of it hasn't really affected Perfect. too much. Uh, mass compliance is pretty high uh, in this area mm-hmm. compared to others um, mm-hmm. in the U.S. Honestly, I think it's just sort of, it's pretty normal just fewer things happen indoors so it hasn't like affected you in a crazy way or anything because i guess you're still working from you're still you, your work yeah, is still inter- uninterrupted i mean in fact what was funny is at the very start of the pandemic when like all of these white collar workers were going from being at the office to figuring out how to work from home and i had been working from home forever that's when mm-hmm. i started doing like the lockdown math live streams where i was going mm-hmm. down to like actively collaborate with two different friends of mine and it just made sense to like be our own little quarantine bubble at that time so the first time in many years i actually had like i'm going off to work today kind of vibe <laughs> and it was just at the moment when the rest of the world was doing the opposite so it was a funny yeah. upside down i tuned into those uh live streams and actually that was before i really like understood imaginary numbers and mm-hmm. so that actually helped like the intuition a lot for that so mm-hmm. you know i thank you for that that was before <laughs> our second it was a year great, too right? a great series yeah that, that, that yeah that mm-hmm. was before we started our second year yeah yeah that was that was as we finished yeah as we finished our first first year year, that's true that's true Mm -hmm. so yeah and actually funnily enough at that time i was telling rayhan like hey you should watch these live streams they're pretty good to like i remember as we're doing nothing at home it's good to you know do a little bit of math and that's kind of at the same time when we started the podcast and Mm -hmm. you know you must have thought like i don't know what what you thought but I emailed you to I'll come on the you. podcast yeah. after we released our very first episode <laughs> and we were completely not ready to have like a guest on the podcast. We were just like getting our, getting our, our bearings, I guess. So yeah, I'm glad that now we kind of, we're more comfortable with doing the whole podcast and I feel like we're a lot less like awkward, I guess, because everyone, I guess when they start. Mm-hmm. Uh, producing content there's some kind of like awkwardness yeah. there oh yeah but i'm glad we're, we're able that to i think do a lot of now. people don't recognize until they start actually making something is just how different you feel once you turn on a record button and have that background yeah. process in your mind running right knowing that it will be posted or at the very least that it exactly, can exact right mm-hmm. yeah. yeah so i, I have it's like infinite empathy for those just starting things off mm-hmm. and understanding that it's always going to be this hump before you get into a completely natural state i don't even know what it's like to be natural by like recording something i think other people like get over it i'll tell you whenever that happens i know exactly where you're coming from Mm -hmm. definitely yeah exactly it it definitely does get easier though as time goes because uh in the beginning it's like it's the only thing your mind can think of it's like oh my god this is like this is like a, a solid like as soon as you get recorded it's going up or you know mm-hmm. unless you're mm-hmm. editing or whatever which the we moment don't do. you think it's 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 gonna be up it's gonna be you know like your recorded version is, is the final one you're like oh no i gotta be mm-hmm. extremely careful but then sometimes even a small mishap it just sends you tumbling down you know so you gotta be careful for those mm-hmm. especially in the beginning yeah and uh, before before we so, you know tr- truly get in i do want to mention some uh, quick quick news uh, we are currently at 49.3 thousand downloads. So whoever's watching this, 
uh, you have definitely helped us get to 50. And uh, so, you know, road to 50, <laughs> let's see it. Uh, and a quick mention on our followers, our Spotify followers, we are very close to 4,000. We're actually uh, around 38, 3,900 right now. So, yeah, very exciting, very exciting few days coming up. That's very incredible. exciting. Yeah, so make sure to um, follow us wherever you're listening to this. And For sure. also check us out on YouTube where this episode is being recorded and posted. Um other than that, you can contact us if you have any questions or mm-hmm. recommendations for episodes that we can make in the future. Make sure to check out our Instagram and send us a message there at math.physics.podcast. Mm-hmm. There it is. All right. There it is. So let's uh, start with the classic. We always have. So, I mean, whoever's been watching the Math and Physics podcast, if you guys know, we have a classic question that we ask every guest that we have on. It's what got you into your field like in your case obviously it's mathematics so was there like a moment either in your childhood or in your school or somewhere that kind of set that 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 made you tell yourself this is for me Hmm. i don't know if there was ever anything so punctuated as like before there was before i was into math and after (laughs) i was into math Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. from a very young age my dad would play sort of like mathy games with me and that surely has to help Mm -hmm. uh I yeah. think you get into a bit of a positive feedback loop there where if when you're really young, you start just thinking about these things in your free time, in this case, maybe because of games with my dad or just interesting puzzles he might give, then you become good at it because like you've been spending time on it. And that's like the only way you get good at something. Mm-hmm. But then if you're a little bit good at it, you get positive feedback in school and things like that. And, you know, when you're a kid, it's easier to self-identify with something like that in a way that embeds it into your personality. Um, so certainly by the time I was like in high school, it was kind of in my personality that like, I like math. That's a, that's not just a thing that I like. It's an aspect of who I am. There's definitely a very influential calculus teacher that I had early on there who sort of opened the doors to like the math that exists outside of the very linear track that is what you see in school. Mm -hmm. Um, so if ever Mm -hmm. there was like a punctuated moment while that wasn't necessarily like turning me from non-math enthusiast to math enthusiast, it definitely like was the start of a new chapter maybe mm-hmm. so telling me about things like the math circles event at a local university or um just like giving me some books that went beyond and things like that so mm-hmm. a lot of gratitude towards him um and then from there the same positive feedback loop kind of kicks in because once mm-hmm. i was starting college it was like well i know what i'm majoring in and it's just a matter of like <laughs> what i do from there whereas everyone else is like what am i going to major in the irony being that i spent a good portion of undergrad getting heavily seduced into computer science uh, <laughs> <laughs> away from math but you know couldn't seduce fully yeah and did you ever get into physics as well you know the funny thing is i loved physics in high school uh and i love physics now actually like i'll just like read about it there was just this big blank spot though where I'd, i never really studied physics in college for whatever reason i think i was busy with like math and computer science <laughs> um i don't know why because like the aspects of math that i like actually come up all the time in physics and um mm just it's at this point maybe something i like in a hobbyist way but because of that blank spot i do have a little bit of a chip on my shoulder in terms of being like oh man i could i could know it much better than i i do now if i had um decided to spend more time while i was in school on that but yeah Mm -hmm. also it's so broad right it's like what what do we mean by physics right there's so true so (laughs) many different things that can touch was there any specific Mm -hmm. physics topic that uh, might have intrigued you because I know, like, especially with, like with math, there are certain there are certain aspects in physics, like you know, like quantum mechanics, for example, that is so heavily embedded in mathematics that I don't know, like a lot of mathematicians like it, you know. So was there like well, a yeah. certain topic like that? So maybe? quantum mechanics, yeah, that, quantum mechanics is an interesting one because I feel like it appeals to me for a very different reason than it initially appeals to a lot of people because it's got this it's got a great marketing arm in some sense where it's like look mm-hmm. at these weird phenomena that happen and this deviation <laughs> from classical mechanics what's most fascinating to me is more like the way that it um looks a lot like classical mechanics or that the math of it has a very similar flavor to like hamiltonian mechanics and why it is that these slight tweaks being made in some sense feel a little bit more natural and like why do those suddenly correspond to different laws of physics um mm-hmm. but you have all of these very fundamental impl- like things that are implicitly there in the rules of qm like uh linear transformations are everywhere right and you step back you're like why why would they have to be linear like that doesn't 
that doesn't feel like a given. It feels nice. It's very elegant. It makes things easy for yeah. us mm-hmm. um, in comparison to what it could have been. But uh, like understanding where that comes from or understanding why uh, like complex numbers are so embedded in there, like that's just very interesting to me, almost more so than these kind of shock and awe, wacky phenomena, uh, you know, is the particle in two places at once kind of mm-hmm. things that you'll find in the popularizations. Um, mm-hmm. So... Yeah, the, the the more it feels that like something mathematically natural also corresponds to a deeper theory, that's that's incredibly intriguing, and mm-hmm. uh, I'm I'm way farther than most people from like understanding that, but it's enough to niggle at the curiosity. Mm-hmm. And it's definitely a weird, um, like teaching experience. I think as like a professor who really does like understand Q and M, uh, QM, which you know who really does understand it you know not that many people truly do and you know the professionals in that field even admit like they don't really understand what's actually going on but to to teach that to like a young physics student who's just getting into it is very hard because you have to introduce these concepts that really make no intuitive sense and just there's no real like there's no good way to teach it you just kind of have to be like this is how this is how things are, I guess. Mm-hmm. And then the more you just play around with it, the more you kind of get used to the math and used to the the behavior of like quantum systems. Mm-hmm. Can I ask, yeah. when you guys learned it, um, was it coming from like a, a wave mechanics down kind of perspective or from like a qubit up kind of perspective? If, and does that um, question make sense? Mm, yeah. Okay. Uh, so in, in first year, we had like an intro... Uh, unit very very and intro was, that was not <laughs> it was it was definitely more yeah. wave mechanics mm-hmm. um he just we were just presented with like schrodinger's equation and then like some easy problems but then our, like going into our actual quantum mechanics like dedicated course in second year it started off with kind of matrix mechanics and then transitioning like how do we use those ideas for wave mechanics and then trying to like solve problems using both methods and to really just get a grasp of the the entire um like the what would you call that the entire like spectrum of of ideas there mm-hmm. but it no was also it, it, it was started and kind of rooted with the uh, wave mechanics because i think it was all dependent on like we were doing like the like we were solving i believe the wave equation and stuff like that you know so i think it was uh, like that's how it was taught to us in a in a very mathematical way and in a way where it kind of also directly kind of applies the physics which i kind of like that hmm you know? yeah because it feels like there is this dichotomy where most introductions do kind of come from this wave mechanic side where the like the the space that you're dealing with is implicitly a function space with like this implicit mm. l2 metric on top of it and uh it's like this very concrete situation because you can actually think about particle dynamics and make computations and assuming the students are all comfortable enough with like PDEs it's like great Mm -hmm. but I I almost feel like I might have been given a gift by just like not studying physics during college because I I mean I came at it from a completely different direction just by like reading Tuscan's introductions to it which was very much more like start with a qubit and work your way out there and from that standpoint it at least to me it like jived a lot more and I think that might be because I'm like comfortable with the math and so starting from something that's a little bit more general in nature and like, um, you know, you're referencing things like a complex vector space is describing your state. It's kind of easier to nod along and say, OK, in, in principle, that feels like a sufficiently natural construction. Um, mm-hmm. But I, you know, wh- what you guys are saying about how you kind of have to just go with these rules that are handed down and like kind of get used to them. I wonder if you do have to like or if there are other approaches such that it doesn't feel like a pile of random, like this Schrodinger equation, like where does mm-hmm. it actually come from? Like, I guess I'll believe yeah. that this is how things go yeah. all the yeah. time. And while, <laughs> like, no matter what, there's a little bit of that, there's something where, like, if you kind of say, hey, what, like, what energy really is, or the role that it fundamentally serves once we're sitting here in quantum mechanics, um, is that it's describing these oscillations over time, uh, or that that's like one of the roles that it has and that's somehow like a lesson that it feels a little bit handed down but then you can use that to inform like where the math is coming from and you're like oh interesting so i guess you would expect it to come up with like uh the imaginary number i sitting next to it and if you're like comfortable with the matrices of it all and like the analogies between a hermitian matrix and a real number 
and all that. Which mm-hmm. again, it's like a lot of heavy math to like sit on top mm-hmm. of your shoulders. But if you're comfortable with that, the idea of like what Schrodinger's equation looks like um, in the more general sense, it like kind of feels natural. It, yeah. it doesn't feel totally thrown out there as long as you're willing to say this is the role that energy serves. And when things have higher energy, it corresponds to like something, whatever that something is oscillating more over time. Like, I don't know. I, I, I think it might be worth whenever students have this feeling that, oh, I guess there's this pile of stuff that we have to get used to. Like each one of those moments is an opportunity for some educator to say, could that have been better motivated? Or mm. what's another way that maybe not even motivation, but just like showing connections between things such that it doesn't feel like an island off in the conceptual space. Mm -hmm. Um, And I do think that like the reason why it particularly feels like that when you are learning it in school is because as you said, it helps a lot to know the mathematics before going into it. And as a student, when you're learning the mathematics as you're going into quantum mechanics, it kind of feels like you're just lost and you you don't have a map to refer to. mm -hmm. You're just you're on this island and you're like, well, okay, uh, yeah, that's I'm, I'm discovering it as we go along. Um, like, because there's so many layers at which you can understand linear algebra, for example. And given that that's the language that's being used to discuss all of this stuff, like, I think complex vector spaces are hard for anyone to understand. Real vector spaces yeah. like, are hard <laughs> enough, but like bringing in complex yeah. and trying to think about what does it mean to have like a complex eigenvalue and all of that. Like to, to try to be learning that concurrently with the stuff that it's being applied to that has a bunch of other baggage coming with it. Um, like that seems like a tricky problem, mm-hmm. but uh, it, it feels solvable in some way that you could come up with the right learning trajectory such that people are being introduced to the new linear algebra notion at just the right time that like motivates the physics. And then they like learn mm-hmm. a new physics motion at just the right time that it reinforces <laughs> the bit of um, mm-hmm. underlying math. But there are a few things I believe, like especially or or at least uh, with our quantum mechanics course uh, specifically, like there are a few things that just weren't taught in. And we were, I think, just supposed to kind of understand it because one very specific example was just differential equations in general. So Parker Mm. is kind of lucky because he was taking a differential equations course as we were taking the quantum mechanics course. And it was so funny because there were so many times when we were talking and he's like, I saw this like two weeks ago in my differential equations. So I'm like, oh, so you already understand the math. But then there's so many things where I'm basically just kind of looking at what he did and repeating it because I'm not really understanding how the differential equation is working because I haven't learned it yet. You know, Mm -hmm. so there are a few things that I just think are disjointed and that just makes the physics so hard when you don't understand the the math. That's what makes it really hard to come at it from the wave equation perspective it's like if you don't mm-hmm. already mm-hmm. have like comfort with partial differential equations <laughs> then it's destined Ex- to be exactly. something that like leaves you in the dust yeah exactly out of curiosity like th- how much did the idea of like matrix exponentiation or operator exponentiation come up in like the qm classes um in in quantum mechanics we we only saw like a couple of problems well and it wasn't like anything super complicated because we were only dealing with like eigenstates like energy eigenstates and so we weren't really like exponentiating the matrices we were kind of just using the properties of eigenstates of the Mm -hmm. matrix and which made it a lot easier and you can kind of ignore the details of exponentiating matrices so um it wasn't really taught to us as like, oh, this is what you should be doing. It's just like, oh, because we're dealing in the framework of eigenstates, you can just you can just multiply the eigenvalue and that's it. Hmm. Yeah, there were a lot of instances when we didn't really have to go too detailed because I think, again, because at the end of the day, this was a second year quantum mechanics course. So, it, I mean, I don't think it was supposed to be too detailed. But uh, have have you ever taken, oh, no, I, I guess you haven't taken a quantum mechanics course before, right? Because yeah. physics, yeah. right? Yeah. It's, it's just all like been independent reading since I was like in mm-hmm. any kind of formal school. Wow. And um, right. what kind of motivated, okay, I, I've always had this question because I've seen you so much on YouTube as three blue, one brown, and sometimes as Khan Academy. And in, in the very beginning, I still remember this was like, I mean, I, I, I can't really quote the year, but this was quite a long time ago when um, I knew you as three blue, one brown. And then I was, I guess, watching a Khan Academy video and I'm like, wait, this guy sounds so much like the other guy. And then like, (laughs) and then, you know, like how, how in Khan Academy, like at the bottom, it always says created by, and then it says Grant Sanders. I'm like, oh, no way. And I I was just shocked. So I, I guess, I guess the question here is 
Was there a, a specific platform that came first? Like, did Khan, did you start Khan Academy before you created your own YouTube platform? Like, did one influence the other? Or how well, so, did that work? As I was finishing college, I just barely started making, just as like a side project, the like animation tool that ended up being sort of the backbone of Three Blue and Brown. So I had made like one, maybe two video lectures with it. And I was also looking, I'd like been tentatively planning to do a PhD at that time, but I wanted to just do something else in between. So I was like looking for what that something else might be. And like long story short, an opportunity at Khan Academy came up. And it was like kind of because I had a couple videos that I could point to as like, oh, here's the kind of things I have created um, that helped open those doors a little bit, even though they weren't like the best videos in the world by any means. So in some sense, like the channel preceded Khan Academy. But definitely Khan Academy was the first thing that I was doing was like, okay, seriously putting my time into the idea of like teaching things online. Mm -hmm. um, and my own channel was just like a, a thing on the side uh, for through the duration there. So they they kind of, kind of happened uh, simultaneously in some ways. But it was definitely, if you're looking at like serious efforts put forward, it was like first Khan Academy for a while and then Three Blue and Brown. Okay. Mm -hmm. cool. As we were talking about quantum mechanics, I was just... Uh, thinking that a video on quantum mechanics for the three blue and brown channel would be absolutely insane. That would be crazy. Because <laughs> I've seen uh, I've seen your video on like quaternions and all that stuff, and it's just so like amazing the the animations that can help you vi visualize some of the concepts that are happening. And so maybe I don't know. I don't know if you feel like totally comfortable with like talking about quantum mechanics and all that. But if you do, that would be awesome. I've thought about it a lot. Um... I mean, one of the reasons I asked just whether like matrix exponential came up in your context is I'm making a video about that now. And one okay. of the things that I feel like once you wrap your mind around the thing that it's trying to solve or the idea of operator exponentiation in general, I feel like that really just uh, helps to read some of the terms from quantum mechanics in a different light. Um, mm -hmm. Like that was maybe what, uh, uh, I, I, I don't know, if, 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 you're, if you're thinking of like Schrodinger's equation, the idea that it's this linear equation and so you're like, okay, in some sense, the way that you can think about the solution is however we think of like general exponentiation and like that those go hand in hand. And like, what does it mean to exponentiate like uh, a skew Hermitian matrix or something like that? Like somehow all of it ends up going through that lens for me. So maybe in the back of my mind, as I start to turn back to making more videos about differential equations, or I should make more about linear algebra at some point, like the thought will be that those are a little bit of a backbone to if I talk about quantum mechanics at some point. Um, so it's on the docket, but then again, a million things are on the docket, so we'll see. <laughs> That's true. Um, also, I wanted to ask you, when you were doing um, your live stream for Lockdown Math, you presented like an easier way to think about the quadratic formula. Mm -hmm. And I found it like obviously super interesting, like, wow, like, why wasn't I ever told this in, in high school? Um, and I want to ask you if there's like anything else you noticed like along the years that like this is an easier way to do something in math. And hmm. they just they just don't mention that to you in, in school. Is there anything else like that? Well, I mean, maybe this is indexing too much off of the quadratic equations example, but like the, the central idea of that one was that like solving a quadratic equation is this puzzle where you know the sum of two numbers and their product, right? And like just what's a nice way to think about that puzzle. And the thing is that puzzle comes up in other contexts too. So like if let's say you want to find the eigenvalues of a two by two matrix. The way we usually think about that is that you kind of subtract lambda times the identity. This sets up a certain quadratic equation. You solve that quadratic equation and you find your lambdas. Mm -hmm. But it's a little bit inefficient because you have the same puzzle in some sense because if you know the product of two like eigenvalues is the determinant of the matrix and the trace is their sum, you can just stare at the matrix and you, already, and you can just like read off what is the sum and what is the product. So you can use that same formula. I forget how I phrased it in that video, but I think like m plus or minus uh, uh, m squared minus d, where m yeah, is like the midpoint like between two numbers, um, or not d, and p, and p is their product. But if, so if you're solving for like eigenvalues, you can actually just do it really quickly once you get practice seeing a two by two matrix, where it's like the midpoint is uh, half the trace. So you just look at the diagonal and take the average of those two numbers. The product is the determinant. And then you just write down like, m plus or minus square root of m squared minus p and you've mm -hmm. like written down the eigenvalues and you didn't need to go through this intermediate step of like setting up the quadratic equation solving the quadratic equation with the quadratic formula and it's like more computationally expensive <laughs> than it needs to be um i don't know i like let's see there's probably a bunch of just little things like that um 
if, if more come up during our discussion, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll try to bring them in. But uh... yeah, definitely. And I actually learned for the first time this year that you can like the when you do find the determinant with like uh, the matrix minus uh, lambda i, um, it's actually like what it reduces to is like lambda squared. Uh, like minus the trace mm -hmm. times lambda and then plus the determinant, which, which I didn't know that at all. Well, but and that's exactly what's going on here because, like, if you yeah. think about that equation, <laughs> that second term is negative the sum, which, which yeah. the sum should be the sum of the eigenvalues, which is the trace, and then yeah. that last term should be the product as long as the leading coefficient is one. So it should be the determinant. So it's, yeah. I mean, it's saying the same thing, but it's <laughs> exactly it's still going through that weird intermediary point of like explicitly writing out the quadratic. Uh, yeah, quadratic but it was weird uh, like seeing that because it was on a lecture side and I was like, wait, is that true? <laughs> and then I, I, I took an example I did. I was like, oh, wow, okay. I can't, like, I, I can't believe I never saw that before. But, well, I mean, whenever, whenever you see that where it's like, okay, I have this thing where it's a pile of algebra and then there's an alternate way that it could be expressed, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's usually a sign that there's another way to think about where that algebra was coming from in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, another example would be uh, you, you brought up like the quaternion video. Like if you look at the product for two quaternions, it's this big mess, right? It's just this big mess of like how you combine all the terms. Mm -hmm. But then there's ways to package it where it's like if you think of it as a scalar part and a vector part, you can write down the product in terms of like the appropriate dot products and cross products of that vector part and like just the products with that scalar. And what that's doing is it's kind of like winking and nodding at you about the fact that there is a different way that you can sort of read what this multiplication is supposed to be doing in the same way that you can kind of read off what cross products and dot products are, both computationally and visually. And so it's like these sort of compressions that you see where a formula turns out to have another nice form is like a suggestion that there's some intuition unrelated to the computations lurking there, like waiting to be found. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, definitely agree. Yeah, and with with all these different subjects that you, you know, obviously talk about on your on your channel, like where do you I guess I mean I guess this is a very vague question, but like, where do you kind of pick the like the central idea for each video? Like, do you kind of have already like do you have it set up for like you know I'm gonna be doing this this and this for like the next three months, or or are you just you know going as it comes or, or like you know thinking about it week by week kind of thing? Like how I how does that I work? I had a better answer to that. Um, I would benefit from being a little bit more systematic in having like good reasons behind. Where content comes from. Mm -hmm. At the, I, I will say what, what I want the answer to look like is that a good video should have a clear aha moment. Mm -hmm. The like the problem is clear, the solution is unclear, but some shift in perspective makes the solution clear. Um, because it's a visual channel, I, I do have a little bit of a filter on. I'll, I'll tend to talk about things that can be visualized more, even though there's lots of super worthy math where the thing that makes it beautiful isn't necessarily some visual to it, but it's like a really nice um, set of algebraic steps or whatever it might be. Um, honestly, if I look back over 2020, I feel a little bit disappointed with the content there, or at least like the principles behind choices going into stuff um, in a way that maybe spurred me to try to be a little bit more cognizant of why I'm choosing topics as I look, look ahead at 21. Um, and one of the things like in the top of that mind is uh, Making sure that I'm making something because like it personally excites me, not because of some vague sense that it should be made. Mm -hmm. um, and then also leaning into the idea that it is a channel about visualizing stuff. So having a good visual core uh, should prioritize a topic above uh, above others. Mm -hmm. uh, are there certain... I have seen oh, your... Sorry. Continue, oh, sorry. continue. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, I, I've seen your, your TED talk where you talk about like getting people interested in, in like math itself, like in general and how... Um, your video, for example, um, the one where the the two mass blocks uh, and their collisions and things like that, and how how pi just comes out of nowhere. <laughs> I found that video, you know, rather fascinating. I'm I'm guessing that was exactly your goal to say like, hey, here's a situation that has nothing to do with a circle, but you know, out comes pi out of nowhere. And I find it's a like an amazing way to just get people to think about math in a different way. And it's not just about adding numbers and multiplying 12 by 12 or whatever, but it's, <laughs> it's, 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 there, there are some mathematical like phenomena that are just embedded everywhere around you. Mm -hmm. So it's such a, I mean, it's a compelling mystery, I guess, because people yeah. love pi. Uh, it's like yeah. such a familiar thing. Um, and it, it doesn't take too much to see why it's mysterious and want to know the answer. So those, those topics are, are gold if you can find them like, hiding under some mm. pile of dirt right? yeah. where 
there's an accessible mystery that itself like motivates all these like new tools that you're going to have to bring in. Mm -hmm. And especially the, the, um, like the most beautiful formula, e to the minus i pi is equal to minus, uh, minus one yeah that's like one of the craziest <laughs> formulas like anyone will ever see like mm-hmm. you have you have two irrational numbers an imaginary number and then like the unit they all come together so perfectly i find that you know like an absolute gem are there other equations like that just beautiful equations that just don't really make logical sense but they just work like in math Sure. Or, well, or... so you bring up like e to the pi i. I mean, in some sense, that that's like a terrible equation because <laughs> it's lying a little bit. Like, because you're like, you you have to define what you mean by e to something when that something isn't just a, isn't just a counting number or a real number. Like, it, it kind of makes sense with real numbers because we extend the idea of repeated multiplication. But I, I think I've talked about this before somewhere. But that equation, like over time, has just rubbed me the wrong way because what it's actually the the claim that it's making. Is like pretty distinct from what the notation implies. Um, like the claim that it's making is when you plug in pi i to a certain infinite polynomial, you land on negative one. And maybe implicit in there is like why this infinite polynomial is related to e and repeated multiplication. But the, like complex exponentiation itself, or imaginary exponentiation, has very little directly related to e. Like when you're computationally verifying this, the number e will never show up in your computer's memory. <laughs> like even nothing even close to it. Um, yeah. So. It, it's it's a beautiful equation, but like I think not not quite for the reasons that have like shot it into fame. <laughs> to your question of like other things that have this, you know that this quite beautiful, but it looked like it doesn't make logical sense. Um, maybe just because I'm like making a video on it, this is more top of mind. But you know you can exponentiate all kinds of things other than imaginary numbers. You can exponentiate matrices. You can exponentiate operators. So if you take um, well, you can abuse the notation and maybe write as e to the power of the derivative. Right, where you're exponentiating an, a certain operator, the derivative that takes in a function and spits out another function, it gets you a new operator. Um, in that case, rather beautifully, the operator it gives you is the right shift operator. So okay. the derivative is something that you take in a function and it spits out something telling you its slope everywhere. The right shift operator takes in a function f of x and it spits out f of x plus one. And it turns out that when you exponentiate the derivative, you get the right shift operator. So that oh, is wow. like this. Um, <laughs> It's a statement that doesn't make sense until you define it, but it, it also has to do with the power series and all that. But it's also this really compact thing that um, read the right way, what it's doing is it's like solving a certain simple PDE that's talking about like transport of like, uh, you know, if, if, the, if the time rate of change of a function is equal to its spatial rate of change, you'd expect to see that function just sort of drift over like a wave over time. Um, so you can like read it off in a very nice way. But written down, it just it looks like this kind of comically absurd thing. It's like, what are you what are you doing? Take an e to the power of a derivative. We know that doesn't make sense. That's just yeah. that's just nonsense. But it's um, that's funny. And yeah, when you go about making a video, how much research do you actually do? Like, how much time do you dedicate to like researching for a particular topic? So I would say that doesn't happen at the moment that I'm starting the video, but that happens like ambiently for the like year or two preceding it, where I think the right way to do it is that you're like constantly just learning new things and like researching new things and trying to come to better mm. understanding and like keeping notes on all that. And then those notes help you inform what the topic list is. And at some point you're looking at like a topic list and you're like, all right, there's a bunch of things that I've come across that are like related to this circle of things. So maybe we can like bring them together. So the actual like research phase on the one hand is like extensive, but it, it, it doesn't dominate the video production process once you say, I'm starting this video. Um, mm-hmm. And in the times that it does, it, it ends up being like very halting, I think, because mm-hmm. it means you're kind of going in without a clear idea of what the video should look like. There was this one video that um, I, I remember watching, which was uh, on how Bitcoin works, like the, like the mm. mathematics behind Bitcoin. Or is there like yeah. a certain... Like, was there a certain intention or a certain goal when you were, uh, I guess, making that video? Like, what was it just simply informative or was it, I don't know, like, did you? I mean, I made that, like, early to mid-2017, which was before, like, a lot of the big, like, cryptocurrency mm-hmm. hype, like, emerged. Um, I, had, I had, like, uh, started reading about Bitcoin when I was in college because I was taking a cryptography class. And cryptography is very cool. There's lots of fun mathematical constructs in there. And it was like one of these applications of like digital signatures and um, like cryptographic hash functions. And 
I just thought like proof of work is a really clever idea. Like mm -hmm. you have this purely mathematical puzzle. How do you come to decentralized consensus? And then you have these tools from cryptography that came about with the intention of letting you pass like secret messages, but they're actually very general. It lets you do other things. And one of them is like reaching decentralized consensus. I'm like, oh, that's cool. And so I thought I would make a video just about the math of that. And maybe at the time there was a little bit more attention pointed towards crypto stuff, but it was definitely a different landscape uh, than like now. Whereas like far, far and away, that is the most degenerate comment section on any of my videos. <laughs> it's so full of like spam and like people trying to like prey on those who are seeking like quote unquote investment advice things. And even though it's yeah. so obviously a video that has nothing to do with like speculation or investing, um, you'll right. still just find the comments like littered with people giving phone numbers to call for like the person oh, who has five <laughs> points of return on such and such. Um, I'm like, oh, why did I dip my toe into this? <laughs> but that itself is a reflection of the whole cryptocurrency space, which is a really weird mix between incredibly intelligent math nerds. Like really some of the smartest people that you'll find are like working on um, things in the broader, broader ecosystem of like, um, you know, blockchain and uh, proofs of stake and all, all of that kind of thing. Like if you've ever had a conversation with Vitalik Buterin, like just a total math nerd who's incredibly smart and like just does active research. On the other mm -hmm. hand, it's such a cesspool of some of the worst scam and like biggest uh, like frauds that you'll you'll find out there with a lot of the like altcoins out there, or like sketchy behavior that's motivated off of um, seeing the speculative attention to the tune of like trillions of dollars pointed at something. Mm -hmm. And so it's this, it's such a weird mix where it leaves such a good taste in your mouth for one reason and such a bad taste in your mouth for another. And mm. uh, yeah, I, I guess I've gotten a little glimpse of both by like putting out some video related to that stuff and then just like seeing what, <laughs> what people's response is. So was yeah. there any for, other video with uh, that you've ever made with which had some crazy amounts of response in either in either direction? Some can be like, I guess, did you ever have one that's crazy positive that maybe motivated you to do maybe another video on it or... Was there maybe a comment section just filled with, hey, it's a trash video or something like that? I don't know. Like, has that ever happened before? I don't know if I've ever gotten like a ton of hate in that way. But um, I think maybe the first video that I made that was in any, any like real sense of the word like viral was at the start of the pandemic. I made one like this was just as I was looking at some of the data for um, COVID cases outside of mainland China. And it was on the order of like hundreds or thousands. It wasn't huge, right? So mm. I was like, oh, interesting. It like follows an exponential curve pretty exactly. That's, <laughs> and so I just decided, oh, this is a fun excuse to make like a lesson about um, the na nature of exponential growth and logistic growth. Um, and then that one, uh, like even though I'd had like popular videos before, the reason I say that one like is the first one with it was in any sense viral is because the way that people were sharing is like people sharing it with each other well outside the ecosystem of who would usually watch math videos. And it was like, the traffic coming in was much more through sharing than it was through like uh, algorithmic recommendation and things like that. And as a result, mm -hmm. you know, the response is it was, it was like seen as much more of like a, um, uh, like a, a social PSA necessarily than maybe that was part of my intent with it. But the content itself is just a math lesson, right? It wasn't like mm -hmm. a PSA, <laughs> but it was sort of used in that way and like commented on in that way. Um, and that was, that was just like different um, from what I'd seen before. Um, yeah, I, don't, I mean, some of the most touching responses have come from like the linear algebra series, I think, where because that's the opportunity to like, it's a series, there's like a lot more videos into it. There's an opportunity for people to um, let it really, it's not going to teach you all of linear algebra or anything close to it. But like for some people, it seems to help like shape the, the interaction they have with their class in college or with mm -hmm. the other ways that they're learning linear algebra. And like the, the notes that come into that effect are... Um, like they're pretty heartwarming and they're encouraging to like do more things like that and probably do shape content decisions. Yeah. And I, I identify with that because last year for my linear algebra course, while I was studying for my final, I was just, you know, I was reading my notes, but I kind of went through everything. I was like, yeah, I don't really know what to do now. <laughs> and so I actually watched your series just to, you know, just to run the concepts through and, you know, the, the visualizations as always are amazing. Mm -hmm. 
uh, as with the rest of your videos, of course. And I just wanted to say earlier, you mentioned that with the Bitcoin video you made, you got like kind of a weird res response and you attracted like uh, a different demographic, I guess, to, to your videos. And we recently had a similar experience. Hmm. We made a video called The Earth is oh, Flat. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, we, we definitely got some some characters in the comment section there. For sure. Um, but you know, it was just funny to see, like, usually our comments are just like, oh, nice video, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and then all of a sudden, we have people that are commenting, like, oh, in 1960, <laughs> the Antarctic expedition, like, all the, all these things about, like, proof that the Earth is flat. It was just, a like, a funny experience. Yeah, that was definitely yeah. a once-in-a-lifetime once experience, because that was such an interesting, like, a controversial topic, right, I guess. So... I mean, talking about that, I think that's a perfect way to ask also, like, have if you've ever done, I guess, because I mean, I haven't seen every single one of the videos on 3 Blue, 1 Brown, right? So I guess the question is, have you ever made a crazy controversial topic, like um, like math on something like that? Because I, I know, like, some millennium problems are pretty, you know, controversial to some people, like, especially when you explain it in a certain way. Hmm. So ha I mean, has there ever been an instance? Math is a wonderful landscape where it's actually probably one of the least controversial areas that you'll find because Very true. the professionals in it, at least, either they like completely agree that something's right or they completely agree that something's wrong or they're like patiently waiting while the jury is out. You can maybe find one or two exceptions to that. Like it's interesting that there was any controversy around like this proposed solution to the ABC conjecture. But outside of like some very extreme cases, it's it's kind of unparalleled for how much consensus there is. And I think that maps also onto the math education side. So I, I purposefully don't talk about like generally publicly controversial topics. I do think there's a very big benefit to having someplace on the internet that's just living on a different island than all of that, mm -hmm. right? That like people can come together independent of where they sit on other stuff and just like share in a love of math. Um, maybe the closest, one of the earliest videos that I made um, it was talking about a divergent sum. If you add up all the positive powers of two, so one plus two plus four plus eight, on and on, um, there is a sense in which that equals negative one. Um, I probably could have done a much better job explaining what I was getting at with that, but I, I thought it's really interesting that, um, well, there's a couple of very real senses in which you can try to say that that divergent sum equals negative one. One is to change the metric that you're using. So instead of a Euclidean metric, if you assign distances between rational numbers according to what's called the two-attic metric, which it satisfies a lot of the rules you would want metrics to have. In a very real sense, like it approaches negative one. Another would be the idea that if you like analytically continue um, the, uh, the function one plus x plus x squared on and on and on in the complex plane, and then you see what that analytic continuation equals at the point um, x equals two, it like equals negative one. And so there's like a lot of points where the universe is like pointing towards this idea, even though for the usual metric we put on numbers and the usual definitions of convergence, like this is a totally divergent sum. Clearly, I didn't explain it well at all because there's like a, a, a meaningful number of responses that are like, this is such obvious BS, like, uh, you know, it's just like flat out wrong and like misleading <laughs> and like such evidence that like mathematicians talk nothing but nonsense. Um, <laughs> And people will get very angry, I think, at the when you take divergent sum seriously. Like, if you look at the comment section on, um, it's a very popular number file video where they talk about like the classic one plus two plus three plus four equals negative one twelve. One over twelve, yeah. And you can yeah. have criticisms about how they Mask. talked about it if you want. Mm -hmm. Like, I think Mathologer uh, had one, one such thing, but um, mm -hmm. the the level of ire in like the comments is not reflective of what any of like the well-intentioned criticisms could like bring to bear on, on that kind of thing. Um, and I, th I think there's actually something very healthy about in math, taking something that you acknowledge doesn't make sense in existing formalisms, but you're like open yourself to, up to asking, is there a way in which this makes sense? And kind of the purpose of what, that like early video that I made was that sometimes this is what inventing math feels like, is that you start with something that it doesn't make sense. It, it straight up doesn't make sense, but there's, there's little indications that you might want it to make sense. And the act of trying to make something that you want to make sense make sense informs the axioms that you choose and informs the new constructs that you invent. Because um, otherwise, where could they come from? Like, where do axioms come from, right? And it's like mm -hmm. this kind of interesting epistemic question. Um, 
But, but a lot of comments there aren't necessarily interested in epistemic questions. And it's more like, you obviously can't add infinitely positive things and get a negative thing. Like that's, uh, there's nothing more obviously true than that. I was like, fair mm. enough. But uh, the, the word obvious is always a red flag for fuzzy thinking. Mm-hmm. I st- uh, um, interesting fact about that, because you mentioned it in grade 12. I still remember my calculus teacher. He used to always make fun of us whenever we used to say the word obvious. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in, especially in, in calculus, like sometimes we would say, oh, this is obviously this. He's like, what do you mean by obvious? And I'm like, well, if you do it, it's, uh, it's clearly this. He's like, you can never use that word. And like he used to get angry at us sometimes simply for using <laughs> the word obvious. Because depending on who you're asking or what context you're talking about, like I guess it's not obvious in all, in all cases. Right. Yeah, I mean, two reasons you shouldn't, especially for the like educational ones, if you're talking to someone and they're coming from a different background, it might not be obvious to them in the way it is to you. Exactly. The yeah. deeper reason is that very few things are actually obvious. And uh, it's, it's usually a sign of um, not wanting to acknowledge how hard something is to explain it with the word obvious mm-hmm. than it is to like unpack it. And calculus is rife with these, right? Like the um, intermediate value theorem or something like that. It's like, I've got a continuous function. At some point, it's negative. At some point, it's positive. In between those, it must pass zero, obviously. <laughs> obviously. Is it obvious? And like, the, it, the more that you step back on trying to justify why such a statement is obvious, it like forces you into really contemplating what you mean by a word like continuous in a way that's pretty healthy for setting yourself up for like real analysis. So independent of whether you plan to explain it to someone or are trying to empathize with those for whom it might be less obvious, like expunging it from your own vocabulary is good for your own learning. I'm probably guilty of this. I'm sure like someone could look through the videos I've made and find like a billion places where I use the word clearly or obvious in ways that are unhealthy, but uh, it's worth striving for still. Hmm. And you were, you mentioned earlier that you're a huge like computer science nerd. Um, Personally, I didn't have the option to take computer science courses in high school. I got that, like my first exposure to any kind of coding was in university for my physics lab course where we had to model different uh, experiments. But do you think that like in the near future, that will become like a very normal thing to take like a computer science class in like grade eight, grade seven? I hope so. I mean, I, I'm just like you. The first computer science class I took was freshman year of university. I, I didn't mm-hmm. have any head starts there. Um, in some sense, having a good math background is like enough to like kind of let you run with it there. But the reason I really hope that we do see that is I think one of the best ways of getting people into math is through programming. Um, and mm-hmm. just I'm biased by living in Silicon Valley, but the number of people I know who started by disliking math, found programming, started to like math because of what it was letting them do with programming. Like it's staggering just Mm -hmm. how Mm. common a trajectory that is um, in a way that feels like, wow, we could weaponize this in order to like get more people learning math if we just Mm. tucked it a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. Um, I I had one friend who we were like getting dinner at some point and it was like the cutest moment where he's like, Grant, I gotta tell you, I, you know, I just found out about the arctan function and like, (laughs) and like, tell me more. Like, uh, is there some inside joke or meme that I'm not getting? Like, you know, what is this? And he just meant the function. He just meant the existence of, like, the inverse tan function. Because for, like, a game that he was programming, he just needed to convert between slope and angle. Um, and it's, like, the tool to do that. Uh, I'm like, that's, imagine if all that's, students wow. had that reaction to, like, learning about inverse trigonometric functions. <laughs> they were, like, yeah. they didn't just tolerate it, but they actively loved the thing that it was doing. Um, I think because a big part of it is because it helped them do what they wanted to do, right? Because a lot of times, because a lot of times with math, unfortunately, a lot of people don't want to learn it, right? They're just like, oh, it's just something I have to do in high school, so I'm just going to do it. Or it's not that they don't want to, but it's it. um, There's no like apparent use for it right like you're learning these waves and it's just like okay exactly and then in computer science i guess i know this now and then in computer science it's literally a direct use of mathematics and i think something even better that computer science does is teaches you you know logic because i think that is the most important thing just like basic programming Mm -hmm. logic especially with like you know comps uh, like like pretty complicated like recursive algorithms uh or any type of modeling functions or or really anything with that you do in like complex coding is so is so rooted in mathematics because of logic and that's i think what 
you know, inspires a lot of people to like math after that, you know? Okay, well, a lot of points there. I mean, so you, you said one of the benefits is that, like, you've got this direct utility. Wholly agree. However, I do think that it's very important to not limit yourself only to the utility motive of math mm. and to, like, also realize that the beauty motive um, is both very real and also um, lets you start to learn some math where the utility is quite delayed, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, uh, I think it's it's going to be hard to immediately motivate, uh, I don't know, like um, combinatorics, let's just say, for example, and like how to count stuff. Because maybe you're doing some probability problem and it comes up and you're like want to, you know, solve what the best poker hand is. And you could mm -hmm. come up with examples. The problem is if you're leaning on that as the only motive, this is a recipe for bad word problems that show up in math textbooks where it's like trying to be applied but it's so obviously a thing the student's never going to encounter in the real world they're like why would i actually be like calculating this probability for balls coming out of urns that are colored in certain ways that it, yeah. it's a little bit self-defeating um so it's very important i think to like acknowledge that sometimes the motive for the people originally studying it was because of the puzzle in and of itself like the the colliding blocks calculating pi thing that you brought up earlier right i think that's a very powerful way to get people to start learning about like momentum transfer and energy and like phase spaces. But it's it's not because of like the direct application there, like the, the bulb of curiosity came from something else. So you don't you don't want to sacrifice one of the tools just because the application one is so powerful. Um, mm -hmm. On the other one, you were saying about how computer science has this value of like teaching you logic. One of the things I most love about it is that it's like you versus the compiler mm -hmm. and you have to own up <laughs> to the fact yeah. when yeah. like your logic was not sound. It, you, you, because for that matter, like good essay writing teaches you logic too, and like debate teaches you logic, and there's lots of things mm -hmm. that teach you good logical rigorous thinking. But when you're a student and you write an essay that's making a case for something, and the grader disagrees with it or they point out logical flaws, there's always room in your mind to say, yeah, but they didn't understand, right? They mm -hmm. didn't really understand what I was getting mm -hmm. at. Mm -hmm. But when it's you versus the compiler, you just have to own up to the fact that like you can't really blame the compiler for the fact that it's not running. Like mm -hmm. it set yeah. up the rules pretty <laughs> clearly. Like you have to fix a problem in your code. Um, in a way that doesn't really happen in, in other domains. And the immediate feedback of that, I think, is what can make it so much more powerful than other domains that are equally like rigorous. Like philosophy would be another one. Like we should maybe teach philosophy more in high school because of what mm -hmm. it does for rigorous thinking. But it doesn't have, it doesn't have a compiler in the same way. Mm -hmm. So there's too much room for um, uh, plausible misunderstanding on the part of your critic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. especially with that compiler um, there right th th there's always the option to immediately check if you're right yes. or wrong and stuff like that and you know and, and i think that's that right there is like the biggest advantage of something like that and also <laughs> most people i think or at least that i see or at least my friends who are in computer science most computer or people who are in computer science are in some way very deeply interested in mathematics i think that's now a more common thing that, well, I think that's unavoidable, though. Yeah, I mean, that's I guess I guess that that was also brought up. But now it's not only that computer science is bringing people to math; it's also that you know because I guess a lot of people are learning computer science in high school now, which is really helpful. That while they're learning it alongside math, it's helping their knowledge and understanding in both. So you know, it's kind of doing it better for 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 both fields. So I think now a lot of computer scientists are also like you know part mathematicians. So that's that's mm. good. <laughs> and Grant, you also brought up the uh, like the beauty factor versus the application factor. And I I agree that like, you know, both are obviously very, very important. But I, I think the application factor is very good as like as like an introduction to get someone into math. Right. You show them like, oh, this is what you can use all of these tools for. Mm -hmm. And then that just gets them like into the slippery slope and then once they get in they they really get to see like the beauty factor of math it it makes them it makes it easier to hold off on the application factor and to just like enjoy the math for what it is and then when the application comes in it just makes it that much sweeter you know mm -hmm. all that all that time you spent trying to rigorously like understand what's actually going on and then you're kind of left in the dark and then suddenly you see the light and it's just like wow this is this feels nice <laughs> I, yeah, when when it's done well, that's definitely the the best way. I guess it's the the thing that I want to push back against is whatever the underlying cause of bad word problems is, because I think they come from a good intention, which is a desire right. to keep things applied. Um, but if that's the dictum handed down from on high, like you have to show how these things are applied, otherwise, like <laughs> it won't motivate the students at all. 
like what you say is absolutely true. If you can start off with a good motivation, there's nothing better as an introduction. Um, but realizing that doing that 80% is sometimes worse than nothing uh, is not always acknowledged. Mm -hmm. I agree. A quick, uh, a, a, a big, sorry, a big thing that I noticed when we went into university different from uh, high school, especially with math, was the fact that in, I mean, it, not that it was insanely, uh, you know, application based in high school, but especially in university, like, you know, taking like analysis courses and, you know, higher, higher level math courses, like we kind of learn like math at a very abstract level. Like, you know, it becomes, it becomes less uh, more physical things like it becomes less numbers and it becomes more oh i have an epsilon ball i have a delta range i have all these different just just these abstract quantities that we're trying to compare so i guess when you transition from high school to college math was there like this notice that oh it's now like did you appreciate the abstractness more because i know some people it's like me for example in the beginning i was not a big fan of how you know, it would just it just was so disjointed from real world problems and just from reality that I was just not making sense of it. So I, I wasn't enjoying it in the beginning. So I guess that's my question. Did you have that moment? Well, so personally, I think I was predisposed enough to really like math that I like started by finding a lot of beauty in just like the abstractions of it or okay. being like, oh, if this is like the way mathematicians phrase it. There's something clearly like very deep and powerful about it. And then like over time, when I would gain a better understanding of a given topic by just having seen enough examples of it or something I was like oh wait that's what all of that was saying or like that was the motivation mm -hmm. for this general construct i sort of came to this much firmer thought that like yes the abstraction is quite beautiful and that should be the goal of thought but like pedagogically the path to get there should involve like a deluge of examples into the mind of the student before you do the abstracting um, even if that's the goal uh, because I, the thing is, we can be quite comfortable with abstractions. Like you, you referenced as an example of something that's like concrete numbers. You like you go from thinking about numbers to epsilon. Mm -hmm. Numbers themselves, in some sense, are an abstraction, right? Like we get wow, very comfortable true. with thinking about the idea of thirty-seven without having to think of thirty-seven things, like thirty-seven apples or thirty-seven yeah. ticks on a board or something. It's like thirty-seven is a thing in and of itself. And we even get to be comfortable after you do like a bunch of high school math with like algebra and letters just being things in and of themselves. You're like reasoning with x and how x is manipulated and all that without having to plug in a particular number. Um, but then as, as you get higher and higher, it's like, well, okay, we're not be, might be, they'd be talking about the real numbers as the field for what X could represent, but it could be any mm -hmm. field. And there, like you want to hold on to the idea of like reals because it's the, the only field you're comfortable <laughs> with, but then you're like in this abstract algebra class where it's like, whatever the field is, you have to go from the axioms. And yeah. eventually the mathematician gets quite comfortable, more comfortable even just thinking in terms of like, any particular field rather than having to limit yourself to the peculiarities of one like the reals but it seems worth understanding what the best path to get there is and i do think that at the start of an undergrad there's a little bit too much of a leap that happens where you go from um whatever the current layer of abstraction people are comfortable with in high school which is maybe somewhere in the realm of like symbols representing numbers or maybe like numbers are still more comfortable and then immediately jumping to like an axiomatization of things I think the reason that happens is because you're going from an environment where the people teaching are professional educators um, to one where the people teaching are professional researchers a lot of the time. And to the mathematician, it is the much better way to understand something when it's at like the highest level of abstraction. In the same way that if I ask you to multiply like, you know, 37 times 23, you're going to think about it in terms of the numbers. You're not going to like picture like, a, a big <laughs> grid of coconuts that's like 37 <laughs> wide and like 23 long and like count through them. Like obviously that's a worse way of doing it um, because you've become comfortable with like a certain higher layer. Uh, but recognizing, recognizing the lack of empathy that sometimes exists can be important. So yeah, it's, it's a tricky subject. Um, but I do, when I write my own scripts, always find that I have first written the abstract thing and then have concrete examples. And I have to tell myself it's actually quite better, like a lot better um, if I can think to reverse that and let everything start off with like a concrete example and get to the abstraction, even if the latter is the goal and it's much more beautiful. And it's kind of the whole point. I was interested in it and all of that. Like mm -hmm. that, the goal is not the same thing as the right entry point. Mm -hmm. Right. And one thing that I find so like interesting is 
you know, when you're taking like an intro to linear algebra course and you're dealing with two dimensional vectors, three dimensional vectors, it's so easy to picture them because you just think, okay, I have an X, Y, and then boom, I, I can just draw it out in front of me. But as soon as you start getting into like spaces like R3, or sorry, R4, R, R5, and all that, you have no real like basis to kind of fall back on except just the pure mathematics of it like you have a four-dimensional vector and i think it's like it, i mean at least i can't really imagine what that looks like but i can i can still understand that you know it's it's a list of numbers and it, it represents something with a direction and a length and that's kind of the only thing i really have at that point mm -hmm. yeah i think this is where there's a kind of like fuzzy intuition that i think people gain where like with a vector, there's so many different ways to think about it. It's like, are you thinking of a vector in 2D space as a list of two numbers, as like a magnitude and direction, as something that's a little bit more formal, where it's like we've defined a vector space and the sense in which it's two dimensional is because of the maximum number of like basis elements we can choose. And like, mm. what's most important is to build a really tight and uh, like well populated set of connections between all the different ways of thinking about it. So that as you go up and you get to like R4, you're like, oh, wait, I lost one of them. <laughs> like, I can't picture it. <laughs> but because I had such tight connections in the other ones, then um, I like understand the connection between the formalisms and the like set of numbers. And in principle, what that might mean for magnitude and direction, especially when it's like, well, sometimes in a four dimensional vector space, you're talking about subspaces of it. And like, you know, what's the what's the subspace of all ones that are, you know, where the the sum of the coordinates equals zero or something. You're like, oh, wait, that's a 3D subspace. I can mm -hmm. actually picture it again. Um, and, you know, as you, as you get even farther out and you talk about like function spaces, maybe it seems even harder because it's infinite dimensional, but there's other concrete ways to think about a function space. Like you graph the function mm -hmm. and you just have mm -hmm. to tell yourself when I'm looking at a graph, that's analogous to seeing just a single point in the vector, a single vector and not like where it lives in the whole space. And so you have this very local sensation that I'm at just one point of this crazy infinite dimensional vector space, but at least I can picture it. And even if I can't see the whole thing, I like have some sense of where I am. Um, but what, like, I, I mean, I guess all I'm really saying is that this is why it's so important to have, have a sense of what the formalism is. Like you can't just lean on the intuition, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but making sure that it's, it's not about one or the other, but it's about the connections between the two seems to be the right, like mm -hmm. the right diagnosis there. Talking about these higher, uh, like these higher dimensions, I remember in uh, in your fractals video, you were talking about uh, like di like one point five dimensions and like two point five dimensions and stuff like that, and I was just mm -hmm. super confused. Like, how what does it mean to have half a dimension? Like how yeah, okay. how it... great question. So okay. the the word dimension um, can can refer to different things. There are different definitions. One of them is if we're talking about dimensions of a vector space, which has to be a counting number because you're saying like how many basis vectors are there, right? Mm -hmm. So like one, two, three, that's all it can mean. The other one um, is describing how much the size of things changes as you scale them, okay? And the thought for like why both of these should be given the same name as opposed to just completely different, like one of them, maybe this should be called the scaling constant and this should be called the basis number, mm -hmm. but we call both dimension, is that in the case of counting numbers, they do coincide. Um, and so in the case of like fractal dimension or like Hausdorff dimension, what we're really saying is the thing that makes something one dimensional is not anything to do with linear algebra or like number of bases. It's that if you double a length scale, the amount of stuff in it only doubles. Like how long is, if you have a two inch line and you like double it, well now it's four inches. Um, and so if like length was the metric, the measure that you were using to get a sense of its size, that's the thing that um, you're looking at how it scales. Whereas if it was a two dimensional square that was like two inches by two inches and I scale it up by a factor of two, its area has gone up by a factor of four. And if it's, um, you know, if it's a cube, it, its area goes up by a factor of eight. And there it's this interesting, maybe it's not that interesting. It's maybe an obvious <laughs> like, connection between the fact that the like linear algebra sense of dimension corresponds to the exponent in that scaling rule. And the whole insight of Hausdorff dimension and fractal dimension is that there's other shapes where the amount of stuff in it, as we scale things, you know, you double, you double some linear um, met metric of it. Like you take a Sierpinski triangle and you double how wide it is. In some sense, the amount of stuff has grown by a factor of three because of the self-similarity that you see and all that. And 
what that suggests is that you want the dimension to be something that's like a number d such that, well, it's not, it didn't scale by two to the power one, it didn't scale by two to the power two, it scaled by something so, so that two to the power d equals three. Um, uh. And it actually lines up quite nicely, like as you wrap your mind around it with the usual notions of dimension. Because if you look at something that's like 1.2 dimensional, it's like very fuzzy, it's like very rough. Uh, so a line is smooth, but it's very rough. And then it goes from 1.2 to 1.5, 1.7, and gets closer and closer to two. It's getting so rough that it almost fills all of 2D space. And something that's like 1.999 dimensional is really like really close to filling all of 2D space, but it's, um, it's like not quite there. Like uh, a good example would be that your the alveoli in your lungs are in some, you can like kind of measure the dimension to be, it's like 2.9 or something like that, which is sort of saying that the, if you were to scale, you know, like a, uh, a human body and like the way the geometry goes and you're saying how many like endpoints are there delivering oxygen, uh, that number, it's almost as if it was filling all of the three dimensional space of your lungs, but it's not quite there. It'll scale a little bit less than if it was filling every single bit of the volume. Oh. Um, so like, it's a, and you see this like in biology a lot where there's a certain kind of fractal dimension to describe how like these sort of self-similar patterns go out to almost fill maybe 2D space or 3D space or something, but like not quite. So um, it's, it's basically a help, like uh, it's, it's explained via how it's scaled basically. Is, exactly. Is, it's, you, okay. You should think of it as like, instead of calling it fractal dimension, you could call it the scaling exponent. And that mm -hmm. would be a much more descriptive title. Mm -hmm. But the, the name dimension is suggestive of the relation it has to the more familiar notions of dimension mm -hmm. that you might have like. Because the way I was thinking about it is like, at least with three dimensions, right? It's, it's, it's physical movements. Like I can go here, I can go here, and I can go <laughs> here. Like, you know, I, I mean, basically like to the, to the audio listeners, I, I basically I was doing like X, Y, and, and I guess Z. <laughs> like I can move up, down in all three dimensions. So I guess it was more of a physical viewing that I was trying to think about. Like I was trying to think about 0.5 and how can I move in a 0.5 direction? I guess I wasn't thinking right. about it in this way. That's very interesting. And I mean, this happens a lot whenever you're extending the definition of one thing beyond something that usually feels like it has to be concrete, uh, uh, discrete. So like um, factorials might be another example where like a factorial, a five factorial, it means five times four times three times two times one. It's got to be... Like exact things. Like mm -hmm. what on earth would it mean to have like one half factorial? Mm -hmm. And the answer is it doesn't mean anything. Okay. But you can extend the definition in a way that everyone agrees <laughs> is sufficiently natural where you're thinking about it in a completely different way. It lines up with what you would expect on all the counting numbers. And in this way, and if you justify why it's like the one kind of correct way to extend it, you can have statements that seem crazy. Like that, the, that one half factorial is equal to, is it square root of pi over two? I think that might be it. It's... I, might be off I know that I know there's a function for it, which is an integral. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember. Is is it like the capital pi? I don't think that's what it is. But no, I mean, the capital pi is the gamma function. Oh right, isn't capital pi the like gamma. the multi like it's 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 the multiplication version of sigma, capital sigma, yeah. right? Yeah, so it's like instead of adding them, you multiply them. Yeah, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah, I, I remember watching a video about the the factorial function, but I don't know. I, I don't really remember all the details, but it's very cool because. You, you go from something that is like discrete and then you just model it to be continuous and then you could just say, okay, I can evaluate at any point, the even point though being, it doesn't make sense like from how it was defined. Yeah, or, to make that step, it does require like thinking about it in an entirely different way. So yeah. like, I, I, you know, when people have like, it doesn't make sense to talk about like 1.5 dimensions, you, you're spot on. It doesn't, <laughs> which is why we have to like, we're talking about a different definition or it doesn't make sense yeah. to talk about one half factorial. Like that's not wrong. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And this is, I mean, math is covered with these things where you're basically overloading a definition and that just, that just makes it such a, uh, I don't know, such a fertile ground for confusion if it's not clear right. to people <laughs> when the definition has been overridden like that. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's also something like fractional derivatives, which I don't even understand. Oh, I've just heard of the name. <laughs> I don't know how that works, though. I, I can give you an example of like a situation where you would kind of want there to be a fractional okay. derivative. Sure. Uh, so if you, if you take the derivative of like the sine function, um, it gets you cosine, which looks just like a sine wave, but it's been shifted over by like a quarter of its period, right? And similarly, taking the derivative of that, it shifts it over again. So you're like, oh, interesting. When I'm taking derivatives of something, each derivative shifts over 
my, um, my function by like pi halves, which is a very discrete feeling thing. You're like chunking it over. But it's a, a discrete way where you kind of could imagine what it would be like to continuously interpolate there. You're like, if I were to take the one half derivative of the sine function, you at least have an expectation of what it should be. It's like, well, it sits halfway between yeah, the sine function and what you get like shifting it over. Um, mm. Now that's a very specific example because you're like, that's all well and good for sine, but what about when you take <laughs> one half derivative of like, um, you know, a polynomial or something like that. Yeah. But uh, it, it happens to be that I, I mean, I, I, I don't know if I should like go into the explanation necessarily, but um, at least in some context, like if you if you take the derivatives of things, um, this can correspond in uh, like after you take a Laplace transform to just multiplying it by a certain constant, and so it's like if you as you take more and more derivatives, it's like multiplying it by the square of that constant and the cube of that constant. So you're like, well, what mm. if instead of multiplying it by the square of the constant, we multiply it by like s to the 1.5 or something like that. Oh, yeah. Um, so it's more like, but in some way that involves reconceptualizing the derivative. It's like first we've transitioned functions into right. this different space where derivatives look like multiplication. That's something that we can more easily extend to be like continuous and then we like translate back. Um, mm -hmm. But of course, like the idea of taking a one half derivative, if we're talking about like the the limit definition of a derivative like it clear it doesn't yeah. it doesn't make it still any doesn't sense. make yeah, sense again, so, like it's so I mean, abstract right like it's not intuitive i wouldn't call that abstract it's just that you're a overriding half, a, a fractional derivative yeah well so that's like that's not abstract it's that you're there's it's an overriding that's happened so it's not that we've created a really general structure and the generality of it um and the like formalism of it is what's making it hard to understand it's that You've just shifted to instead talking about mm -hmm. something that is no longer the original definition of a derivative mm -hmm. that we had. I guess that's there true. should hopefully be a plausible reason that we're using the same term. It should hopefully be related to the derivative. Otherwise, it's a total like catastrophe yeah. of mm -hmm. terminology. Um, <laughs> but in the same way that like one half factorial is just a different thing, or taking one point five dimension dimensional objects, mm -hmm. it's a different notion of dimension. It's like it's a new concept that is related to a familiar concept, so related that we gave it the same name, which is maybe a bad idea because then it makes it seem like foreign and crazy. But it's mm -hmm. like it's a thing we do all the time. You do this in programming too. You you have a function, then you overwrite its definition when there's like a different type that you're like passing into it, and like we're all we're all comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. And that makes me think about um, like the the discovery of mathematics and how when. Like before we had integral and differential calculus, it was just kind of like, okay, how do you transition into that? And so kind of um, what I'm trying to say here is that before we know what we know now, it's kind of it's kind of like, how do you even take that leap of faith into into bringing something that that could be useful when you add it to to what we do know? And so, like, this is very hard to word, <laughs> but what, what, what I'm trying to say is, like, do you think that, like, mathematics is just, like, this pyramid of building blocks that are, like, naturally falling one on top of the other and then that accumulate to the, the pyramid of knowledge that we know now? Or do you think it was kind of like, like God picking out these blocks and being like, here, this is what we know now? Oh, and this is and from here you can you can get this block and then that fits there and then the next one falls out. it's like it's not it's not a natural process it's just kind of like selected so it's sequential right? is what you're asking is that what you're asking yeah. like if it's mm -hmm. yeah basically i to take your picture i i would picture the development of math much more like you've got just bricks lying everywhere they're not really like in line with each other as we mm -hmm. start to get a f sense of the shape of some of them, we go over to another part of the building and we're like, oh, wait, we were building that wrong the whole time. You picked <laughs> out some of those bricks, you put them in based on what you now found, and then you keep going. And then later on, you're like, oh, wait, this whole section like really isn't actually how we should do it. Let's take that down. And we found some new bricks that we put in. But then once you're teaching it to the students, you're just like walking them up the existing tower. And you're like, yeah, nice <laughs> the pieces fit together. And we have this yeah. beautiful building where all the shapes mesh to each other. And they're like, what's that pile of bricks over there? You're like, don't worry about that. That's research. But this, this is what you're focused on right now. <laughs> I was like, well, the, act the actual like discovery process is, I mean, you know, like the terminology that we put to things often comes like decades after the original uh, like use of that thing. Um, and sometimes when you have it like related to all of these other general structures, like it was kind of a discovery to find that relation, but the actual uses of it were much more bespoke uh, in their origins. 
So it's not at all, at all like this um, careful layer by layer construction that it has always looked the way that we see it now. Um, I mean, you take one example, if you go really ancient, like for a while, people didn't really even think about numbers and ratios as the same thing. They were just different types. Like to talk about two is a very different thing than talking about two over one. Those are different mm. objects. They're different types. You can't relate them um, in the same way that like, uh, like areas and length are like different types. And you can't talk about like the area of a square equaling the length of some other thing. Um, whereas now we just intermingle the types all the time. And we're like, how do you interpret the cross product? Oh, it's a vector whose length is the same as the area of this parallelogram. Like, that's <laughs> weird. That, yeah. <laughs> like an object where like a length is the same as an area. But we're like, ah, they're all numbers. Numbers are the same. But whether that's the right way we should think about it or not, it was a, a change from how things uh, originally were, where there was a lot more um, distinction. Like pi itself was not thought of as a number. It was a ratio. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as well as like negative numbers as well like before mm -hmm. people just didn't know how to like how to think of negative numbers because they just didn't really exist like in nature mm -hmm. well I, at least they couldn't find examples back when negative numbers didn't exist right. we came up with the or at least in in when in one of our episodes we were talking about how people started to think about negative numbers and how it kind of originated as debt that they you know mm -hmm. that they had so if, if, if they had money and they owed someone something that would be, oh, negative 100, right? That means I owe them $100, so like stuff like that. And I think that was a really interesting way to, you know, conceptualize negative numbers. And now, you know, they're obviously so useful in a, in a, in a, in a daily use. So one question that I think we can, we can uh, finish the podcast with, and this is, uh, this is a very interesting one, or at least really interesting to me. What do you think is the most significant unsolved mathematics problem? Or is there a mo like a very big unsolved mathematics problem? Hmm. I mean, so often the answers to that kind of question are limited to, you've got like named problems, like, you mm -hmm. know, the millennium problems or twin prime conjecture or things like this. And something like find one of those that feels the most significant which is maybe the motive for coming up with the millennium problem or like hilbert's problems in the mm -hmm. turn of the 20th century but um maybe like a better way for people to think about it is like general programs that exist so there's like um like the langland's program which is this it's not like a problem per se but it's more like a huge class of problems on like people have suspicions about a bunch of connections um, that exist between different fields of math and it's not like there's ever going to be a point where it's like so and so solved all of them, right? Mm -hmm. It's just, of course. It, it is one of these buildings being constructed and being like re-architected. And in some sense, that's a lot more important because the more connections you build up, the more problem solving tools it gives you. Um, I'll admit, I don't personally like know the full, full depths of that one, but like the little bits that I have like had glimpses of, it's like clearly of fundamental importance because um, I mean, to take one example, like Fermat's last theorem, right? It, it came about from this connection between seemingly different related objects, like elliptic curves and modular forms. And that's like one of the kinds of connections that this like program as a whole is um, as centered towards. Uh, and more, I think more often we should find ways to give the same prestige to things like that that we do to say like the Riemann hypothesis, which is important, but mm -hmm. If you're like a grad student saying like, what, what would be like the greatest thing to contribute to? Um, maybe the answer shouldn't be like a solution to one of these famous problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. Well, we are coming up. This is like one of our longest episodes. And ever. I... I think, I think that's okay. I think that's okay. Yeah. That's a <laughs> yeah, it was, special guest exception. It was awesome. <laughs> it was awesome. So um, thank you so much, Grant. First of all, for for coming up, coming Absolutely. on to the podcast today, we appreciate, we appreciate it. Thanks for having um, me. On. This was fun. Yeah. Yeah. So we we love to have you on some other time. Of course, we we have tons of other points to to discuss. If you'd like to come on another time. Mm -hmm. Um. Other than that, thank you so much to the listener for listening to this episode. If you've made it this far, of course. Please follow us on the platform you're listening oh, cool. on. Yeah. Also, check out the YouTube channel where this uh, podcast is being recorded and posted. Mm -hmm. uh, any comments, questions, you can hit us up on Instagram at math.physics.podcast. 
Anything to say? Before, right? Yeah, but before we sign off, I just wanted to say once again, Grant, thank you so much for coming on. We uh we were okay. So quick uh, quick side note for so last week when or whenever you emailed Parker that uh you know we can do this, we were studying for our math exam, but which was today, and I still remember even during the study process we were getting so excited, like no way, <laughs> like on the day our exam ends we're interviewing Grant. So it's so again we thank you a lot for coming on here. It was really nice, and uh, again we hope to have you on again. Sure, yeah, this is absolutely. Fun. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Right. right so um, this has been episode number forty-five with Grant Sanderson. Uh, thank you everyone for listening. Uh, I'm your host Parker, and I'm Ray, and we will see you soon. Peace. See ya.